What's up? Welcome back for our afternoon edition, day two here at Automate Live. My name is Chris Lukey, host of the Manufacturing Happy Hour podcast. I'm joined all week by Jake Hall, the Manufacturing Millennial, and we got John Schechter from Auto Store on. How you doing, John? Doing good. Thanks, Chris. Well, it's great to have you here. We know you're recently the new VP of Business Development in North America for Auto Store, but we're going to take it back even further for our first question. We want to get an intro to how you got started in this industry. Can you share a bit of that background? Yeah, uh, got lucky. Uh, landed outside, when I left college, landed at Kiva Systems into warehouse robotics right away. Spent about eight years there doing different projects across e-commerce, manufacturing, and uh, eventually Amazon. And then um, joined a piece picking company for a couple of years doing uh, at Right Hand Robotics, doing the similar kind of applications, but touching the inventory more directly, and then mm -hmm. have been three years at Auto Store. Awesome. All right. Now, when we talk about auto store, I think of immediately the automated storage retrieval systems, the warehouse and logistics space. Can we start with just a high level education? What has been happening in the industry yeah. the last really less than three years, three-ish years, that has really transformed the way companies are doing business and yeah. leveraging technology? Yeah, I think companies for a long time, you know, everybody's got a space challenge, everybody has a labor challenge, and it's, it's really come to bear recently. Um, in the last three years, you know, during COVID, it was incredibly difficult to get labor and rental rates and construction was down. So rental rates went up and so space became even more of a premium. We've seen that in our business, but also a lot of the other technologies that uh, automate storage and retrieval of inventory. Um, and I, I think this trend has existed for a long time. There's more complexity, more SKUs, more inventory being stocked and more order complexity with higher service levels. So you just need more tools in order to get that stuff out to your customers or to your production line. So when we look at the, the, the higher level of stuff, when it comes to manufacturers or distributors bringing products, shipping out the door, shipping it to your front door or to um, you know, the, the inventory of a company, um, how is your technology unique in terms of presenting companies with an opportunity not only for deploying productivity or, or deploying solutions faster, but also making it scalable as they grow? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, what our technology does is really digitize someone's inventory. And so when you click on a website or if you're ordering spare parts through a manufacturer, your, your click is actually going all the way down to the level of the inventory starts to move. So you're starting that, that process with our system. Um, it's a technology that can scale with the business too. So we have a lot of people that get started, they put a bit of their inventory into an auto store, and then they continue to grow it over time as their business grows. So they don't have to overinvest or plan too far ahead. Nobody has the ability to predict that far, and so it gives them a chance to defer any extra investment until they really need it. So when I hear digitize inventory, I have a visualization of what that looks like. You were also talking about how you help with spare parts distribution. So how does digitizing inventory impact spare parts distribution? Yeah. I mean, spare parts distribution is one of the hardest things, right? It's every time a new product comes out, there's hundreds of new SKUs that you then have to stock in inventory. And you have to have those readily available for next day fulfillment. So a lot of our customers are in Memphis and everything they're shipping is going directly onto a plane. Well, they need to get it out of their building as quickly as possible and a technology like ours helps to enable that. So when companies are looking at adopting this type of technology for the first time, what are some of the quick, what are some of the questions that they should be asking to know if the solution's right for them and if they're they're ready for this technology and if they're worried about it, how do they overcome that worry? Yeah. I, I think there's certainly like a hierarchy of needs for a warehouse, right? If yeah. you're if you have pain points in your manufacturing production line, that's generally where people are spending first. And then when you look at your warehouse, um, you know, really first looking at like, what are the challenges? What are the pains that you feel? And if space isn't one of them and labor isn't one of them, then, you know, maybe it's more about organization and process. You don't need automation necessarily for that. Um, but if it is space and labor, which it generally is, uh, eventually, you know, an auto store or something like it is uh, one of those kind of things that you can uh, evolve to. So maybe you start first with people and process on the ground, yeah. and then you might implement a WMS or some other software that helps to orchestrate the flow of inventory, and then you get to the automated levels where you look at packaging automation, storage and retrieval for um, supporting picking and, and packing, and, and other forms. So Jake, I'm glad you asked about technology adoption and comfort with that because John, what I didn't know about you before this conversation was that you were at Kiva going to Amazon during that acquisition. So I think 
speak to your unique experience of what it's like when a company acquires a technology yeah. and how do you make sure that gets adopted effectively, right? Because we can talk about buying you know, from a supplier, right? Yeah. But that's literally an investment saying, you are part of our company now. So I think you can give a real good example around what that was like to help our audience out there understand how to do a smooth technology adoption, if you will. Yeah, and it's super common in this space. There's a lot of consolidation. There's always companies that are kind of merging and bringing different banners of products together. And I think ultimately the, the reason the Kiva acquisition was successful is it was fully embraced by all of the operations people at Amazon to see this as a new tool they could really uptake. And I think for the Kiva team, it also was important to be okay with the amount of change that comes with like getting integrated into an organization. So they didn't, Amazon didn't use the system in the same way it had been used before. And for any acquisition, uh, there's a different use case that might be more valuable to that acquirer than what the original one it set out was. And so that can be painful for the individuals that like built in a certain direction and they need to quickly pivot and turn to a new direction. But but ultimately, you know, Amazon's had a lot of success rolling out. Uh, you know, they have 750,000 AMRs in their network at this point. Wow. And uh, doing a bunch of different functions. but. Uh, it's a very successful acquisition. No kidding, like this is I think a, yeah. one of the biggest takeaways for the audience out there today, right? Like what I heard you say was the operators at Amazon fully embraced the technology and also the company being acquired, Kiva embraced mm. that they were going to be leveraged slightly differently than they had been before. So it's a two-way street of change acceptance. So. That's my quick summary there. Yeah. Jake, what do you and, got? And so I love talking about acceptance of technology. And, and the one thing that we, we look at in the warehouse industry, operators are a very high turnover rate, right? Because a lot of times if, if automated retrieval systems were not put in place, they're walking a lot, yeah. moving back and forth to, to pick up this product. And you know, a lot of times look at tablets, find the area, it's labor intensive, which makes the industry not really suitable for a lot of people they want to leave. So when you look at you're putting in technology and, and, and new systems. How are you keeping the worker in mind? Yeah. You know, how are you leveraging technology to make the worker more efficient, but yeah. also make it so their daily tasks are more enjoyable for them? Yeah. I, I use the example that, you know, imagine a warehouse today that was moving pallets, but you didn't give the workers a forklift. Like, that's what it's like having a small parts distribution environment without an auto store or something supporting their function. You're asking them to do mundane, walking, searching, kind of wasting their time, basically, and, and nobody gets value out of that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, our companies from Norway and in Northern Europe, it was essential that you provide a really sophisticated system so you're leveraging somebody's time uh, and most value. And I think we're seeing that permeate to other, other economies as well. And certainly in broader Europe and North America and, and Asia, there's a huge uptake of this stuff because that's how you retain and, and attract people. And it also yeah. helps, especially in this field, it helps to attract a younger workforce that's brought up digitally native, Absolutely. that expects to be Absolutely. working with software and tools. And if you if you, they show up at a warehouse and they're going to pick from paper with no software and, and, and technology, you know, they're just going to be asking where they can go, where they can be working off of a tablet or working off of something that's a little more interesting than collated paper sheets for their day's work. Yeah. So I think talking about the next generation segues into this question also, and that is what is your prediction for maybe the warehousing space specifically or automation industry as a whole over the next one to two years? What's one of your big bets put on your, you know, look inside your crystal ball if yeah. you will? Yeah, o over the next one to two years. So. I think uh, we, we believe that only 20% of warehouses have any level of automation, and so that's going to continue to get to maybe 30, 40% penetration. That inventory will be walking and talking in these facilities, right? Today, it's 80% are on shelves and, and is completely non-digital, is just is waiting to be handled by people. Um, I think you're going to continue to see further automation, collaborating with automation. You know, you see, I think, more of that on the manufacturing side, uh, but but you'll see that on the warehousing distribution side of things, where you'll have picking robots picking out of auto stores or AMRs and ASRSs kind of working in tandem. Um, so that's going to continue to happen. Now, I think people are still an essential part of this distribution no challenge. Doubt. So it's yeah. it's not, you know, we're on a, uh, I don't even like to say a path to, to lights out. It's a path to continued collaboration between the right machines and the right people to get the job done. 
less than 20% of warehouses have automation. I think that's a guy. I a love statistic. the specific, the specific right. stats. You even said where yeah. you thought it was going to go, too. You know, so I want to I want to carry on with that. So 20% of companies do have automation. Can you share a story with us on how a company has successfully adopted the technology that you're deploying and how that shifted them as a company in the way they, they do business? Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you one uh, one industrial example and then one retail retail example. So on the industrial side, you know, we work with John Deere and Caterpillar in their spare parts networks, and it's been a sea change for their for the way they get their small parts to customers faster. Yeah. And so, you know, they just they're able to push the service levels above and beyond what um, what they were able to do in the past. And again, for their organizations at down at the warehouse level they now can attract and retain a pool of talent that may have been going to other places that had technology. Um, and so it really, you know, they're, they're tried and true product sets, but now the owners of those products have a really good uh, maintenance and ownership lifetime experience. So I'm going to pause you there. I want you to use the other example, but like the takeaway from that is every company is automated. Like when you think of warehouse and advanced, and advanced like uh, automated storage retrieval systems, you don't think of like a John Deere. Or, or you know, companies like that that are doing those type of systems, you would think of, oh, it's some e-commerce mm -hmm. company that's doing this, where it shows that. Listen, every company, in almost every industry, is adapting. That. So, so yeah. what's the other example? Yeah, that you I have? mean, we're seeing the same, you know, the same challenge in industrial parts, in retail, in pharmaceuticals and healthcare, uh, 3PLs, et cetera. So everybody has the same growing SKU complexity, growing order complexity, and they they all need these same tools. Um, on the retail side, is an interesting example is Best Buy. So. They, they have eight auto stores across their network and they re-engineered their entire network strategy to compete in the digital age, right? So they were looking at two to three day plus fulfillment and that just wasn't going to cut it, right? Yeah. People were going to order from other places. And they looked at that and said, we need to be able to offer same day and next day economically, right? We can't do it to just lose money. Yeah. You can't ship it across the country with uh, it by plane necessarily. So they, they re-engineered their whole network and they use an auto store inside their facilities to speed up that cycle time so they can get a lot of a lot of places, uh, you know, around the major urban centers, yeah. you can order from Best Buy and get by 5 p.m. You get that that night, if not the next morning. Yeah, you know, we've uh, one thing we haven't talked about a lot today, Jake, is sustainability. We're talking about planes flying all over the place. Yeah, I'd be interested to get your take because we only have a couple minutes left. Yeah. what are what is you, what are you doing? What is Auto Store doing? How does your solution impact sustainability? Right, I've got some ideas, but I'd love to hear it from you. Yeah, I mean, we've we've won a green uh, supply chain award four years in a row. It's, our robot only uses 100 watts. If you could believe that, it's like a little bit more yeah. than a laptop. Um, so we help people cut down their energy consumption even using automation, but also because you're compressing the space you use, your real estate footprint is lower, your actual space that you're lighting and cooling and heating is uh, significantly less. So that helps along the way. And then the system lasts a really long time. So it's not disposable technology that gets you through a few years that you have to throw out and replace with new machines. It actually will stay with you for, we don't even know how long it'll last. We have sites that are 18 years old at this point. So that that's a different long-term sustainability that I think people forget about when they're buying equipment. And they're not, not thinking about how long that equipment's going to stay with them and really get useful life of. Awesome. Yeah. So kind of as we wrap the question up, where do you see the next big leaps and steps when it comes to this type of technology and the way companies are doing business, right? What, what is going to make it so 70% of companies start leveraging automation in warehouses, not just 20? Yeah, yeah, I think um, software integration is still a challenging area. You know, we work through systems integrators that help along that process, but if you have an ERP or a WMS, a lot of times those are 10 plus years old, mm -hmm. and it's not that you can't adopt new technologies like AutoStore, but you start to layer in new stuff on top of your old systems, and, and then if you don't have the in-house expertise to manage those systems over the yeah. long run, that can become a burden or a, a speed bump to getting to this new stuff. So that that's going to, think, continue to shift. People are going to modernize and be on new platforms that are, if they're cloud-based, they're no yeah. longer on like a fixed version, right? They're always on the latest and greatest, and that helps you unlock um, new technologies. I'd say with some of the stuff you're going to see at the show here, it's going to be more computer vision guided, pick and, pick and place technologies, but just robustness in the automation that it's not so brittle that it's going to break. So you can, you know, uh, uh, robotic systems that can see and track what's happening and, yeah. and change on the fly so that they stay reliable. Yeah. John, great insights, great stories, great uh, predictions. I'm excited to see how those play out. That's the wrap on this interview. We'll be back for more soon. John, thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jake.